We're delighted to have with us this morning uh, to share with us Brother Prince Platner and his uh, bride of 48 years, Miss Marty. <coughs> I, um, I'll let Prince tell you a lot of his story. He's, uh, he's been around a while, and he's been around a while. He's, uh, his last uh, vocational job for several years was with a petroleum company, and what, they, what he did on that actually was um, they would go into areas and map out areas like for marketing, like how much had to be supplied for a particular area for all the population. Literally did that around the entire world for other nations as well. So a very strategic planner and visionary in those kind of ways. I was a pretty, pretty good athlete growing up. I actually played football. I, hate, I almost hate to say this here. Oklahoma State University. Was that the Cowboys? Did y'all, y'all didn't play Arkansas back then, did you? No, no, I didn't have, didn't have enough courage to play Arkansas back then. No. <laughs> played, uh, played some football, did some coaching after, after that, you know, high school coaching and stuff, football coaching. And then he was in the military, served in the Air Force and Guard, and some of y'all might be old enough to remember the Berlin airlift thing, you know, when Berlin was cut in half between communists and... Well, he was involved in that, and I asked him, I said, what in the world did you do with the Berlin airlift thing? And he said, uh, Chuck, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. So I, I don't know. He, <clears throat> he's uh, walked in high places in the Christian world as well uh, with uh, men that have m- had major leadership movement roles inside the church around the world, like Bill Bright and others, you know, Campus Crusade for Christ, and knows a lot of those folks on that level personally. Uh, the only sad thing I know about <coughs> Brother Prince right now is he and Marty are getting ready to move back to Texas. Why are y'all going to? Yeah, he's got family down there. So uh, I first met Brother Prince actually because of our sheriff's breakfast that we do here every month. Uh, he's a friend of law enforcement. Just a real bright light everywhere he goes. And uh, I met Prince and through the sheriff and the sheriff's department. <coughs> In December, uh, this past December, at our sheriff's breakfast, Prince, and I think Sheriff Holiday asked him to share some of his testimony, and he started sharing some of his life testimony because uh, Sheriff Holiday knows him very well as well. And as he shared with me those few minutes after we got through that breakfast there at the start of December, I just, I just thought our church needs to hear this. Cedar Heights Baptist uh, would love to hear this story, and so I started talking to Brother Prince about that and. And they were actually, uh, they are getting ready to move back to Texas. Uh, for their family, son lives down there, moving down closer to be with them. But their house wouldn't sell. And I said, I'm going to keep praying you can't sell your house till you share, share your testimony. Amen? And so as it works out, they have somebody coming to look at their house this afternoon, and he shared the testimony this morning. Isn't that great? So you can blame me for the delay there. Um, let me give you a, just a real quick synopsis of Miss Marty. Um, we were in my office between services. We were sitting there visiting, and, and Brother Prince, he's always doing, he's always got a scripture, and he was sharing some scripture with me. And then he opened his Bible and started reading some from scripture. And I noticed as he was reading, I, I looked, Miss Marty was sitting there, and I looked at Miss Marty, and just not saying anything, she was quoting word for word every word he was reading, word for word. And I thought, yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty powerful. And all the way through that, she just sat there, quoted every single word. So uh, we have a great couple with us today, and I want Brother Prince, if you would now, Brother Prince Platner, you come share with us. Let's give Brother Prince a Cedar Heights welcome. Thank you, Brother. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Charlie, and good morning to the Saints of Cedar Height Baptist Church. It's such a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, we all have an adventure. And the adventure really becomes exciting when we allow Jesus Christ to be the one that takes us on that daily adventure. He has places he takes us. He shows us things. He touches us in ways that we could never imagine. I pray that's your walk today. But I had a walk. I've got my 
Are we, ba are we back feeding here? Uh, my walk started in the summer of 1935 in the month of July. A little 16-year-old girl that was a senior in high school became pregnant and conception started. And the Lord touched me at that time when he made it happen. Nine months later, on March 13, 1936, I was born at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, the amazing thing is that she came from a Midwestern state, and her parents were Methodist. And the Methodists had, as well as some other denominations, they had homes for unwed mothers, and this one happened to be in Kansas City, Missouri, in Jackson County. And her father just happened to work for the railroad. And so she had a pass, and this young lady, lonely, all by herself, got on that train and went to Kansas City, Missouri, where she gave birth to me in March 13th, 1936. But she didn't stay around very long, and that had to be extremely difficult on her because I've found out since that she's a very sensitive lady and has great deep feelings. So she went home, but we're going to leave her at home now, back in her little community where she grew up. And we're going to pick up another couple that lived in Tillman County, Oklahoma, halfway between Grandfield and Frederick, eight miles north of the Red River, right north of Wichita Falls, Texas. Their last name was Platner, the same as mine. And they both are in their 30s. And they could not have children. And they wanted a child. And they attended the Methodist Church in a little country town called Loveland, Oklahoma. Had about 90 people in those days. Got about three today. And through the church, they found out about this home in Kansas City where they could adopt. Now, they wanted a boy to start with. They eventually adopted a girl, my sister, who was adopted three years later. But the amazing thing, back in 1936, they had no way of knowing what the birth was. So consequently, they had to wait, and they didn't have a whole lot of faxes and emails and stuff back then. So there had to be a letter sent out to tell them that they had a little boy available to them in Kansas City. My mother got on the bus from Lawton, Oklahoma, and went to Kansas City and picked me up. I was adopted on March the 17th, 1936. Amazing, you may not know this, but when you're adopted, your birth mother, you have, a, you have a birth certificate by your birth mother. And then when you're adopted, you get another birth certificate by your adopting parents. So I have two birth certificates. But the state of Missouri was a closed state, so that meant that that first birth certificate went into the bowels of the, of the capital at Jeff City, Missouri, to stay forever. So I grew up down on the wheat farm land of Oklahoma, doing the things that all little boys do. I was a very active young man, loved to get into things. I could probably ask more questions in a minute than you could answer in an hour. And I, I was always curious about everything. Went to church. My aunt taught Sunday school. Aunt Gladys, so sweet, used to tell us about Jesus. And I always thought Jesus had to be the sweetest, greatest guy there ever was. So this goes on until about the through the sixth grade after my father returned from serving in World War II in the Pacific. He was in the Navy. And he decided that he didn't like eating all that dust every day and when he was harvesting, and he wanted to get a ranch. So he moved to Stigler, Oklahoma. Someone here this morning was from Spyro, and we had a chat and knew some same people. But that's where he moved to, and I started in the seventh grade. Now, I was touched again at that time in the seventh grade 
because we had a pastor and his friend, which wouldn't happen today, from Tulsa Bible Church, Tulsa, Oklahoma, that came and had an assembly. Many of you have been to Ohio School Assemblies. But at that assembly, they gave a message of good news that Jesus Christ was Lord and Savior of all and that he would forgive us of our sins if we would acknowledge him as Lord and Savior, confess our sins, and give them to him. Well, if not, we're going to go to hell and burn. And boy, I didn't want to burn. So I prayed at age 12 and gave my life to Jesus Christ, I thought. Well, my grandmother Farley on my side, my mother's side, was a very deep Christian lady. And I had get, received a little book for her, kind of like a little Gideon small Bible in the old King James. It was, it was really pretty difficult to read and very small. had a little small light, probably 25 watt in my room, and I struggled for about two or three weeks, and I finally just couldn't do it. Now, I must give you a little insight into my some of my weaknesses, I have dyslexia. And if you know dyslexia, a dys dyslexia person has trouble reading, and also a pers person, also, they have trouble spelling. I still can't spell. My wife will tell you that. And I'm glad to have my beloved wife here with me this morning of 48 years. Marty is a precious saint. She loves Jesus. Uh, she's been through so many Bible studies. And as we went on through our years, I graduated from high school, had a scholarship to Oklahoma State University, got hurt, laid out a year, graduated from the University of Tulsa, coached and, and taught at a, at a town up northwest of Tulsa. Uh, but during that time, I got called up in the Berlin crisis. And uh, they sent me to Schenectady, in New York. I don't even know how to spell it, let alone where it was. But I found out real quick when I showed up. But we had a chaplain there. We had a Swedish young guy, man, just loved him. He could beat every one of us in ping pong. He came down with cancer. They put him in the VA hospital, and he died. And he was on my precious wife's floor. She was floor nurse. And through all that, we came to know each other. And a couple years later, we got married. After, after that was over, I went back, and I didn't go back into coaching. I went to work for Phyllis Petroleum Company, where my uncle worked. And uh, we spent about 10 years there. We lived in Omaha, Nebraska. We lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where our son was born. Back in Minneapolis, back to Bartersville, Oklahoma, and back to Minneapolis, where I left Phillips when they, when they got out of their retailing, and I moved to, we moved to Dallas, Texas. But right before we left Minneapolis, Miss Marty and I were struggling in our marriage. And I got up and left one day on Monday morning, and I said, I'm leaving. I packed my bag and didn't call or come back for the week. But on Friday afternoon, I called. And I said, Marty, I said, how are the children? I really wanted to know how she was. I was dying to get home to be with my family, but I was too proud to tell her that. Pride will get you. And she says, well, your daughter's crying says, but your son says, Mom, don't cry. We'll find another dad. That hit me right square in the belly. I went home that night and haven't left and never will. Praise Jesus. But amazing, during that week, the Lutheran pastor across the street came over when he heard that I'd left. And he told Miss Marty, says, you cannot get through this on your own. You need Jesus Christ. Now, she's got another testimony. She grew up in, in a church, in, in a home where they didn't allow them to go to church. But she got saved. That was the starting of her process as she started to grow in the Lord. We moved to Dallas, and she got involved with Christian Women's Club down there, and they were great teachers. And three of them, Three of these women took her under her wing. And as a result of that, she really grew, and I saw it, and I liked it. And we got involved, invited to a men, a dinner where the women were inviting their husbands to join it. Now, we didn't know they'd set this up for us lost husbands to get saved. 
Amazing how the Lord works that. But I heard Bob George speak, who was on Crystal's staff at First Baptist. He gave his testimony how he had searched, come from Ohio, went to California, searched for wealth, and found millions, and was getting ready to commit suicide when a man told him that what he really needed was Jesus Christ. I went up to Bob, and I didn't even know what a testimony was. And he said, I, told, I shared with Bob how much I enjoyed what he had to say. He said, next Tuesday morning at the Dallas Country Club, there's going to be a businessman luncheon. They're going to have a speaker from Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and his name is Art DeMoss. I think you'd enjoy hearing him. Well, I went, and sure enough, when I got there, the man says, I told him what I was there for, and I was a little early. That happens to be my tendency. He says, go in that door there, and that's where you'll be. And I went into that room, set up for about 600-plus people. I came right back out, and I said, no, sir. I said, there'd be too many people in there. There would be at me there. He said, sir, if that's what you're looking for, that's it. Well, I went in and sat down, and I, I sat about right there looking at the podium. And all of a sudden, a little guy walked in, dark hair, dark eyes, uh, dark glasses, a blue blazer, blue shirt, red and blue tie, gray pants, and penny loafers. Went right over, and he packed the mic. And it worked. And he come by, and I thought, well, that's the electrician checking things out. <laughs> come over and just take his hand out, and he says, I'm Art DeMoss. Well, no one told me who the speaker was. I said, well, pleased to meet you, sir. Well, he went on. But when they introduced him, he had a message. And his message was that he had gone to Las Vegas to, to become rich, and he found out a way how to make money out there as a dealer. He went back to Albany, New York. Bingo! Albany, Schenectady, Troy are the Tri-Cities, three, three hours north of New York City. That's where my wife came from. I set up when I heard that. Now, you think that was by chance? No way. That he would mention he was from Albany, New York, because that's where my wife, that was where the VA was. Amazing. So consequently, he gave the testimony how he had gotten saved at a luncheon like this, and he invited us to accept Jesus Christ. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I went home and got out my legal pad, which I'd used so many times, the old yellow legal pad, and started writing on both sides, wrote over five pages of sins. And I gave every one of them to the sweet Lord Jesus, and he forgave me for every sin I'd ever done, past, present, and future. Praise the Lord. Get a letter in the mail on Friday from John Mazel, a quarterback who, after me, followed me at Oklahoma State University, invited me on Monday morning to go to a, to a breakfast at Denny's and find out what happened to me when I prayed that sinner's prayer. And I thought, well, that's a good thing. I ought to find out what happened, and I went. And when he got through, he said, now, are we going to do this three Mondays in a row, and once you're through that, then you can come in on Tuesday. So Tuesday, I said, well, do I have to wait for the three, or can I come in the morning? He said, you can come in the morning. I met a fellow there by the name of Don Logue, Honorable mention, All-American quarterback, University of Arkansas, sir. <laughs> 1948 and 1949. And uh, he, said, I, I, he, he says, I'd like to invite you to come to our church. And we did. And it was the first fellowship, Bible church, that was established by Dr. Gene Getz. And we grew, went through elders training, wound up going to Tulsa when we moved to Tulsa and started the church up there. We continued on. I might say from a spiritual standpoint, we were growing every year. We started reading the Bible in the 70s, and I think Marty and I have read through it every year since. Amazing. I was telling Pastor, amazing what you read. I've read first, I've read chapter 1 of Ephesians so many times. But sometime, somehow or another I overlooked where it says, before he created the heavens, and the earth. He knew me, and I was blameless. And he adopted, and he predestined me to be adopted into his family. 
wow, that really changed my thinking. 1995, I'm working out of Tulsa, and uh, Major Ian Thomas coming through, and uh, we had a week-long men's brown bag lunch, and uh, I went, and we covered his book. Every person ought to read this book once a year. It's a little small book. It's called The Saving Life of Christ. What happened to me that week, I was able to move Jesus Christ from my head to my heart. I came to understand I've been crucified. I no longer live, but Jesus Christ lives in me. Wow. So it really wasn't me doing the living. It's not me up here talking to you. This is the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ speaking to you this morning, telling his story of what he's done in the life of Prince Platner. Praise the Lord. I would, I, I would tear it up. I'm asking him every moment to give me the words that he wants me to share with you. So we, we moseyed along there, getting ready to go to Bible school in Vancouver, British Columbia on the island. And I came down and became quite ill with acute pancreatitis. I went down on the day after 9-11. I went down on 9-12. Our son had just had his third daughter over here, and I came over to pick Miss Marty up. We stopped in Alma at Taco Bell, and I thought I got food poisoned, but I had acute pancreatitis. They put me in a hospital Wednesday night. By Friday at 5 o'clock, my children were there, my daughter and our son and Marty. Five doctors told them that I had a 10% chance of living two hours. I did eventually die twice, but they brought me back. I'm not supposed to be here. But God had a purpose. Praise the Lord. Well, after we'd gone off to school, I might say, right after the 19, in 1993, my father died. In 1997, my mother died. So in the fall of 97, I started going back to my files and doing some research. Now we're going to pick up with that little 16-year-old girl again who gave birth out of wedlock. And I decided I might should find her because I have three granddaughters now. And I've got a son. And maybe there's some kind of disease or something that they might have. And I need to know, I felt we need to know that as a family. So I found out what to do, wound up and went through the sickness, went off to Bible school and came back. And we built a home in Maumelle because her son was with Family Life. He's now transferred and took those six kids to Austin, Texas, and that's the reason we're selling our house and going to Austin. We miss those little guys. Three of them are adopted, little black children, sweet as can be. We love them. But I made contact with, uh, with, the, with the county, Jackson County, in Kansas City, and they told the process I had to go through. I had to hire somebody that had been licensed to do this research. So I did that. I heard a lady out of Minneapolis named Sandy. And she started to work, and she worked for quite some time to no avail. She could not find my mother. So it requires that if you want to get into those, that, that birth certificate that sits in the bowels of the state capital of Jefferson, you got to have a, you got to have a, a court order by a judge. Well, they got a court order by a judge, and she got a copy of it. And she found my birth mother's name. And she called me. She said, I found her. I know what her name is. She didn't say I found her. She said, I know what her name is. And I know, I know where she lived at the time that she gave birth to you. I said, well, tell me. She said, I can't because it's all closed. You can, you'll never know that. All I'll tell you is now we need to find out if she, if she has passed on or if she's still alive. So we started the process, and I said, well, what was her name? She says, it was a little short name. I said, Jones. She said, no, it's not Jones. I said, but it's a very popular name. I said, okay. So I guessed a couple more to no avail. 
So she wound up, and I said, well, what state am I from? And I always thought I came from Iowa or Nebraska or Minnesota or Wisconsin or Illinois or Missouri. And after I went over each one, she says, no, that's not it. Now, being a salesman, you listen to people when they talk because their words will lead you down a path that you may not want to go or that you want to go. And she said, what state do you live in? I said, well, I live in Arkansas. She said, oh, isn't that interesting? They jumped from one state to the other. I said, whoa, hold it. The light bulb went off. I said, you're telling me that somebody jumped from one state to another? She said, yes. I said, did they jump from Tennessee to Oklahoma? And she said, I didn't say that. I just said they jumped from that first state to the second state. Huh. Yes, they had jumped, had moved from Tennessee to Oklahoma. So my birth mother was from Oklahoma, where my, where my adopted parents were from. Man, that excited me. I said, well, what's, what type of town is it? She said, well, I know it's got a railroad that runs through it, and it's got a college in it. So I, I guessed quite a few, and to no avail. Then I said to her, I said, I have this little piece of paper that was given to me, two little pieces of paper, and it tells me what my name was. And I told her that my name was Harry C. I won't give you the last name because it's still under, under table here. And, uh, huh. She says, and I said, I've got another little piece of paper that tells me that my mother's name was started with a G. And she says, interesting. I says, oh? She says, yeah, 98% of the time, those are exactly your mother's name. But that's all I can tell you. So I called DJ, a good friend of mine that had worked with me in the prayer breakfast over about the about the last seven years out of Colorado Springs, and I told it to her because it took her 35 years to find her grandfather when she did, on, did in the genealogy search. And she said, let me go to work on it. And she had got on the genealogy website and went to work. She came back, she said, yeah, I found him in the 1920 census in Tennessee. I said, oh, so... I said, well, I think they've moved to Oklahoma. She said, won't you call the state and order death certificates for these names? And she gave me the name of my grandmother and my grandfather. I did that. And sure enough, they came back, and they had died and were buried in the city that I lived in, Oklahoma, Tulsa. So I called my friend real quick in Tulsa, and I said, would you run down to the library and get a copy of the obituary for these two names? And I says, why don't you just fax them to me? I was getting a little anxious about that time, as you can imagine. Oh, and in about three hours, I had them on my fax. The first one for the father, the grandfather, was signed the was signed by his wife, whose name started with an S. But her name, she lived to be way in her 90s, over 95, her name was signed by someone who had a different last name, but her first name started with a G, and it was exactly the same name that was on those two little pieces of paper I had. I said, bingo. We got it. So I called Sandy in Minneapolis, and I said, Sandy, guess what we found out? So I told her all this, and she was dumbfounded. She said, where in the world did you get that? I said, can't tell you. It's all covered. <laughs> she laughed and said, oh, come on. I said, no. I, says, I said, oh, well. So I told her about my friend DJ. There's a computer program that if someone has your address, 
they can run that computer program and it will tell you the two people living on each side of you and what their names are and their telephone numbers. So she called this number and the lady said, said do you know Miss so-and-so? I said, oh my, yes, one of the sweetest women I've ever known. Just a precious one. I said, do you know where she's at now? She says, yes, she's still living. She's in a assisted living at such and such nursing home. Now, she lived only 15 minutes from us in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She's only two miles from where we lived in the nursing home. So I called my friend, another friend, and I said, would you and your wife, I said, I know you're looking for a, a place to put, assisted living, a place to put your mother. Would you go down and check this place out? And would you, I said, see what you can find. And by this time, my friend, my researcher had already called her and talked to her, knew what room she was in and everything. So they went by, and they talked to the lady, and they took a picture of her sleeping in her chair watching television in her room. So they sent that to me. About three weeks later, we went over there, and I told him, let's go take a look. So I went, and she was sleeping again, kind of like me. I like to sleep in the afternoon. But pop, I took another picture. So this goes on for, for a little bit of time, and we're doing more research, finding, more, finding out more information about the family, and which we shouldn't have had access to, but it came out we did. And uh, I went back to see her. Marty was, would stop. Marty had an appointment in Tulsa, and uh, I went to see her, and she wasn't there. I thought, oh, no. I asked the nurse, I said, has she passed away? They said, no, they moved her over to full service on the other end. So I went over there, and it was, you had to have a password to get in, or a key, and I didn't have it. But I had my Bible, and I was going to go in and just visit with her and pray with her. And as I went in, I watched till somebody went in, and guess what I did? You're right. I followed him in the door. <laughs> I went up and I asked what room Miss So-and-so was in. They said, it's that room right there, right across from the desk. I said, that's a good place. That's the room they had me in when I was in intensive care for 110 days, right across from the desk of the nurses. You know, that was kind of interesting. I had a special touch while I was in there. We had a lady in there who was a black lady. She came from Africa. Very well educated. She was a nurse. And she was a pastor of a little small church. And her name was Grace. Amazing Grace. And she'd always try to get us, and Marty was always trying to get her. I want to say something about my wife, how precious she is. She's a nurse. My mother was a nurse, my adopted mother. 145 days she was there every day from before breakfast till after supper. That's a touch. Anyway, amazing grace would touch me. Because about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd wake up and somebody would be singing. Now, Joel would appreciate that. She had a beautiful voice, Joel. And I would sit there and I'd say, and it was like angels. It was so beautiful. And, and I, I didn't know if I'd gone to heaven or if I was still around. And I'd say, is that you, Grace? You'd say, that's me. So we'd go on. Let's go back to the full service she wasn't there in the room, so I asked the, the uh, assistant, uh, the nurse there, I said, she's not in her room. Oh, oh, she was over there sitting watching television with them. So I said, wanted to make sure I knew which one because I'd really never got a look at her. And she t I said, which chair is it? She said, I said, okay. So I went over there to her, and I took my Bible, And 
I got down on my knees. And she was on my left side. And I took her hand. And she took my hand. I'd waited 70 years to feel my mother's hand. We visited, not for long, but long enough. She had beautiful blue eyes, just like she said she would when she was asked, what would you like for him to know? That I was a beautiful blue-eyed blonde when I was 16 years old. I got up, but the Holy Spirit touched me like I've never been touched before in my life, and he's touched me many times. You see, I was then able to connect the dots from the conception till that moment how many times I had been touched in so many ways by so many people. I want to say this to you, all ages. You need to touch somebody every day because you need to be touched. There's a reward when you touch. Men, women need to be loved, 724. And women, men need to be affirmed, affirmed, 724. And if you want to change your relationship and make it exciting and an adventure, you give God the glory and start loving your wife 24 and start affirming your husband 24 hours a day, and you'll see a totally different change in, in the two of you as you grow together. It will just blow your mind. And one other little thing, that when someone asks you how you are, get rid of the word fine and get rid of the word okay. And use the word bless. I don't care if it's the grocery store, I don't care who it is. Because there is only one person. And when you speak that word bless, the Holy Spirit comes out of you and touches that person. And I don't care who it is. I've been doing it for years. They will know that you're a Christian, and they will know that they're being touched by God. Only God can touch us through the power of his Holy Spirit and the presence of the Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what happened. Now, wh now where am I on this a little story I'm telling you on my trip. You see, I can't do anything because it's all locked up. And it will be that way. The only thing will happen, they just passed a law in the state of Missouri that when my birth mother dies, I can request and get all the records that are in there. But I don't think they have as much information as I do today. But the glorious thing is that God gave me the opportunity to open that dark door. It was dark in there. We sang a song, the first, the, uh, the first service in, 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 verse, in, in one, where it says, it's dark, there's no light. That's where I was. That's what I was wanting to search. My son asked me, Eric, he said, Dad, why are you searching to find your birth mother? You told me you were a platner, and you always would be a platner. I said, I am a platner and always will be a platner. I said, but I got this room, Eric. It's dark, and I want to find out what's in there, if I possibly can, if the Lord will bless me with that. I said, I believe there's a purpose in it. The purpose is that I have the opportunity to share with you that I've been touched. I know he touches each one of you. I had people come up this morning and tell me after the first service, God touches us. We've been touched. It's just amazing what God will do if you allow him to touch others through you.
and you will be touched in return. I pray God's blessing upon each and every one of you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity and my wife to come and share Jesus Christ's story through us. God bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't think it'll be a surprise to anybody that one of Brother Prince's and Marty's favorite songs is that old song, He Touched Me. Uh, we're going to sing here in a minute. That song goes kind of like this. I, you may know it well enough. Let's just uh, together. Starts off, shackled by a heavy burden. Remember that? Neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. Grab somebody's hand, all right, just sitting beside you. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, now I know He touched me and made me whole. Let's stand together, okay? Joel's going to lead us. If you'd like to come and pray, come and pray. Whatever the Lord has on your heart, do that right now. Yeah. 